flamethrower into Charizard. I'm gonna need all the luck in the world now. Now, if you're not a complete nerd like me and don't understand the mechanical complexity of this kid's game, don't worry, I've got you covered. But this video presupposes that you at least understand the basic premise of Pokemon, or why did you even click on it in the first place? Pokemon Fire Red is notorious for being a difficult video game, and anyone who has actually played it will agree that that statement is not true. So there I was, wondering how to make this game hard, and that's when I discovered a certain mod. This patch turns every trainer battle into a 1v2, directly simulating the experience of invading an Elden Ring. Not only that, but I had the choice between two versions of this mod. One where spread moves worked, and one where they didn't. If you don't know what this means, don't worry, I'll explain when it becomes relevant, but let's just say I picked the harder one. Now the title of this video is probably some garbage, like, can you beat Pokemon if every battle is a 2v1, and the answer to that question is, obviously. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by playing dumb here, but what if in addition to every trainer fight being a 2v1, I up the stakes a bit? I'm not just going to do a normal playthrough of this game, I'm going to nuzlocke it as well. <laughs> Mr. YouTuber, I hear you say. I have a life, what is this nuzlocke you speak of? Glad you asked, dear viewer. You look lovely today, by the way. A Nuzlocke is the name of a rule set that adults use to cope with the fact that they still spend hours a day playing a game made for toddlers. Nuzlocks make the game harder by restricting the Pokemon you can use, and adding permadeath as a penalty for letting one of your precious creatures faint. The typical rules of a Nuzlocke are, you may only catch the first Pokemon you encounter in a new area. If you fail to catch it, you may not catch another. And if a Pokemon's health drops to zero, it's dead. Forever. However, there are a few additional rules that myself and my fellow hardcore Nuzlockers abide by. I'm not arguing with a cat boy! The following clauses are intended to make the game even harder. No bag items in battle. Held items, however, are okay. No overleveling past the next gym leader's ace. And the dupes, or species clause. If an encounter is the same evolution line as one I already own, I re-roll for a new encounter. So, with the rules in place, let's get on with the challenge. Hey guys, before I begin the run, I just wanted to mention that according to YouTube analytics, less than 0.1% of the people who watch my videos are actually women. Wait, that's the wrong statistic. For a second, I thought basically none of you were subscribed. Uh, let's see here. Oh, never mind. Fuck you guys. To start off, we pick Bulbasaur, because he's my personal favorite Gen 1 starter. Okay, not really. I just thought he would be the best pick for a challenge like this. And by the end of the video, I think you'll agree with me. By the way, make sure to leave a comment down below to let me know which starter was the first one you picked after your parents got divorced. Mine was Litten when I played Ultra Moon in 2018. The nickname theme was supposed to be Seasonings and Spices, but this got less and less true as I ran out of spices to reference from the rack in my kitchen. The beginning of the game is fairly uneventful, so I'll speedrun the important bits. Route 1, we caught a Pidgey and named it Jasmine. Route 22, we caught a Rattata and named it Pepper. Route 2, Gangweedle, named it Vinegar. And finally, Viridian Forest gave us a Caterpie we named Pumpkin. Pumpkin ain't a spice? Then I'm not a white girl. Now, I sure did list off several Pokemon names, but what do they all mean in the context of this challenge? Fret not. In order to clarify, I've gone through the trouble of ranking these encounters in the most objective and unbiased way possible. At this point, you might be thinking to yourself, have I been bamboozled? Japed, even? Every battle shown so far has been a 1v1. Well, there's your answer. Only trainers with two or more party members are capable of ganking. Everyone else will be a regular battle. The bug catchers in Viridian Forest gave us no trouble as they mostly spammed string shot. After that, we made it to the first gym leader, Brock, our first major hurdle in this challenge. Normally, you'd send out Bulbasaur and win in two turns with Fine Whip for an easy badge, but now we have to fight two at once. And nothing's changed. I promise this run will get difficult, so be patient. We head to Route 4 and buy the fish who shall not be named from some bloke at the Poke Center, then proceeded to name it Chili. Now, I need to take a moment to address the allegations. There have been numerous slanderous accusations made against me, and I feel like I have to make a response and clear up all the misinformation. The way that I spelled Chili here has caused the false rumor to spread that I am secretly British. This is completely baseless slander and I will not tolerate any of it on my channel. That tangent aside, I was actually tempted to ban Magikarp because of how notoriously broken its evolution Gyarados is. In the end, I decided not to since I had no idea what kind of difficulty spikes I'd encounter during this run. In summary, I'm a little bitch. On Route 3, we catch a Spearow and name it Spearmint. In Mount Moon, we catch a Geodude and name it Cumin. 
Then we grab the Helix Fossil. I only mention this to please all you Helix enjoyers out there. This thing never actually gets used or even revived for that matter because it's garbage. After that, we make our way to the bridge, the one in Cerulean where we fight our rival. I was worried that for the first time in this run, a fight might pose a threat. It's Pidgeotto Abra. That's actually so perfect. That makes this fight just a 1v1. Look at the booty on Rattata in this game. Uh, I'm not imagining it, right? That thing dummy thick. So yeah, the rival turned out to be a glorified 1v1. We catch an Oddish on Route 24 and name it Time. I was really looking forward to catching a Pokemon on Route 25, but... To most people, this would be a dead encounter, since Abra's only move is Teleport, which guarantees its escape if your Pokeball fails on the first turn. But I came prepared. No Abra has ever escaped me, and none ever will. I caught the teleporting son of a bitch, called it Basil, and stuffed it in a box. Then we sallied over to the gym to challenge Misty. Before I show the gym fight, allow me to return to the tier list once more to rank our new encounters. This is the Gyarados tier. Now what the Gyarados tier is, is it's a tier for only Gyarados. Next up we have Geodude. Even though I don't have trade evolutions on, this thing was pretty goaded. We have Fero next. Sure, this thing can be goaded. It was just a pretty good flying type. Nothing really to say. Actually, I don't know. Oddish? Now, I don't have anything against Oddish in particular. I think that uh, Vileplume is actually a pretty good Pokemon. But unfortunately, this thing is going in the cringe tier. And that's just by virtue of the fact that I already have Venusaur, who just does Oddish's job in this challenge, but better. Abra. This thing can't even evolve into Alakazam in this run. It sucks fuck. For the fight with Misty, I leak Gyarados since it resists Water Pulse and can hit Starmie with a super effective bite. But since her Water Pulse has a 30% chance of leaving Gyarados more confused than my target audience when I bully them for their interests, there's a whole lot that can go wrong. I could be taking anywhere between 0 and 2 Water Pulses per turn, so the confusion chance varied wildly on my luck. This fight could end without even a single confusion, or we could be death marching the team into an onslaught of self hits one after another. To improve my odds a bit, I had Gyarados hold the only person berry available at this point in the game, to cure its confusion just once. The rest of the plan is simple. Pray to whatever god you believe in. Second match acquired! Easy! Next gym! On a relaxing cruise, we meet our rival once again, but this time his Kadabra and Raticate are all grown up. Since last time he led with Pidgeotto and Abra, I assumed he would do the same this time. Unfortunately... Oh, it's Raticate first. Okay, Raticate goes first, I think. Nuts. Uh, sand attack. This is what I was afraid of. So now we need this to hit. Okay, I want this to... Ooh, he missed Disable. Ooh, we hit Hyper Fang. Easy game. Not as lucky as shit. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. After rubbing down an old man, we get off the ship and catch a Diglett in Diglett Cave. My early onset Alzheimer's makes its grand debut as I name a Pokemon Pepper for the second time. I've literally caught like 12 Pokemon by this point, what the fuck is wrong with me? Swept through the third gym leader, Lieutenant Guile, as his entire team gets completely walled by literally just a rock with arms. I would talk more about some of these gym leaders, but there really is nothing to say about some of these fights. They're complete pushovers. Badge 3 out of 8 acquired. Next one, okay, this is an easy one. East of Vermilion, we catch Drowsy and name it Honey. And with that, this naming theme has officially been derailed, so I might as well give up now. It only gets worse from here. Route 10, right before Rock Tunnel, we catch Ekans. And Route 9, we catch... nothing. Everything is a duplicate of something we already have, meaning we forfeit the encounter for this route. Since I couldn't be asked to teach a Pokémon Flash, we stumble blindly through the tunnel for the authentic Glaucoma experience. Things went about as smoothly as they could have. After smacking into walls and tumbling down several ladders, I'm thinking, when does this challenge get even remotely difficult? And if that sounds like blatant foreshadowing to you, you'd be correct. Rock Throw Mud Sport. Magnitude 9 set. Oh shit. That was a crit. Oh, you're kidding. No. Allow me to stumble over my own words as I attempt to rationalize why this happened. So that begs the question, why didn't I just teach Gyarados the move Water Pulse? Well, uh... Sweeping that casualty under the rug, we arrive in Lavender Town, a place that was way cooler in the original Red and Green when the music used to blast the Game Boy's poor speakers to dust. We head west into Route 8 where we catch a guaranteed Growlithe encounter. 
This could have gone horribly wrong since Growlithe can use Roar, which would force the battle to end and for us to fail the encounter. But we catch the little fire pupper and call it Cajun. On Route 7, we catch nothing again, because this game has basically zero encounter variety. In Celadon City, however, we get a gift Eevee named Sriracha, which I plan on evolving into Jolteon since it's basically the only good electric type in the game. Hey, you know what time it is? Time for this video's sponsor. Just kidding. It's another tier list. I ended up evolving Eevee into Jolteon, and Jolteon kicks ass. It's basically the only good electric type in the game. Growlithe? Now this thing would have been a lot better if it had the ability Intimidate, it had Flash Fire, it's still a goaded ass Pokemon. Next up in the I don't know tier we have Hypno. This thing was underwhelming, I thought it would be better. Primeape, I didn't really end up using this thing, but on paper it's alright. Ekans, now this thing would actually probably be goaded if I had banned Gyarados, because this thing also gets Intimidate. If I didn't have Gyarados filling that role already, this thing would probably be in the goaded tier. Next up, we challenge Erika for our fourth badge. This gym is basically the one and only time Beedrill gets the chance to be useful this whole run. It resists both Poison and Grass, which are pretty much the only attacking moves that Erika can use. Now aside from the Water Gym, there hasn't been much of a reason for me to use my brain this entire run. That wasn't the case here, and there were a lot of close calls in this fight. Victory Bell, Tangela. Don't worry, Butterfree. You've got this. I'm rooting for you. I pray I get the roll on this. Ooh, that's quite a bit of damage. Uh-oh, wait, Constrict? Constrict isn't, uh, okay, Constrict is not like Bind and Wrap. Didn't get the roll. Okay, we live one more wrap or uh, acid crit, so we'll stay in one more turn with Butterfree. Luckily, we lived a crit there. No. No! Why did that drop my defense? No! What? Okay. <laughs> I thought I was going to die to constrict there. Could switch in uh, vinegar here. If I switch him in and use rage. So we can hit rage on victory bell this turn. And then the Tangela will attack us with Constrict, probably. And then we should be able to live one hit from Vileplume, no matter what it is. And we can stay in and use Twin Needle now, just to get a good chunk of damage off. I'll go Rattata for this. No defense drop. Dude, come on. No speed drop. Dude, come on. Okay, we're still faster. Amazing. That's, uh, that's a bit sketch, so Ember needs to KO this turn then, or else we lose Growlithe. Yes. Honestly had me shaking a little bit there, wondering who was going to die. Alright! That one actually was a bit of a challenge. Had we gotten even slightly worse luck here, one of our beloved Pokémon would have been dying for sure. But nothing died, and the run is still flawless. Don't look back, it can't hurt you anymore. Up next on the agenda is a rival battle at Pokemon Tower. I haven't been looking up any of the trainer teams, so I wasn't exactly sure what to expect, but surely the level difference would be enough to get us through without any casualties, right? Further up in the tower, we do a little ghost busting and catch us a ghastly named Cinnamon. The rest of the tower is a joke, so let's skip to the part where we get the Poke Flute and use it to awaken the Snorlax on Route 12 which we immediately put back to sleep because it's easier to catch that way. The fight against Snorlax actually ended up being pretty risky since its headbutt threatened to KO a lot of my team with critical hits, and I rolled those dice a lot this encounter, because this thing broke out of like 15 great balls. Dude, that Snorlax catch, they really make you work for it, huh? We could have got the leftovers item here as well, but I forgot how the item finder worked in this game and concluded it must be one of those Mandela effects the kids are always talking about and promptly gave up. I eventually came back later and found it, but I should mention that despite there being two places to grab leftovers, I have a rule of only using one of them on my team at any given time, since it's such an overpowered held item. On the way to Cycling Road, we catch a Doduo, which I accidentally forget to name, and pick up the move Fly for convenience sake. On the way out, I wasn't paying attention and found myself in a battle that could spell disaster. <sighs> Whatever. Ah! I hate happy couples! These are two scary looking Pokemon. I'm trapped in. It's over. Oh no, 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 not confusion, not self hit. Anything but self hit. Okay. I'm not trapped in with Fire Spin anymore. Huge. Okay. Now on to Cycling Road. It was only a short ride down to Fuchsia City where the 5th gym is located. On second thought, I don't want to be here. 
Never mind, I guess I decided to go the other way? Time for a lightning round. Route 6, we avoided an encounter here, but now we're back with a rod to fish up a polywag named Paprika. On Route 15, we nab a Venonat and name it Ketchup. In the Safari Zone, we nab an Execute named... This is the laziest one yet. In Fuchsia City, we invite ourselves into some guy's backyard and fish up a Sea King we named Soy Sauce. Uh-oh, tier list time! Hollywrath? Pretty goaded. I didn't actually really end up using him this playthrough, but I just know that if I, again, didn't have Gyarados, Polyrath would probably be my water type of choice. Seeking in the cringe tier. We also have Executor in the cringe tier. These are in no particular order, by the way. Haunter, again, it's another one of those trade evolutions, but it was okay for what I used it for. Uh, Venonat, Venomoth, I don't know, didn't really use it. Doduo, Dodrio, probably just a better Firo, if I'm being honest. Snorlax? This is the only exception. This is going in the Gyarados tier. I'm actually going to rank it above Gyarados. Gyarados and Snorlax. Absolutely insane Pokemon. After that, it's straight to Fuchsia Gym. And this is one of the first times in the challenge where that spread move thing I mentioned at the start of the video presents some complications. See, some of Gym Leader Koga's Pokemon know the move Self-Destruct, a 200 power normal type move, which for comparison, the strongest attack on my team currently is the move Surf at 95 base power, but it gets even worse. The moves Self-Destruct and Explosion are particularly deadly in this generation, since when the game does the damage calculation for these moves, it essentially treats the defending Pokémon as if their defense stat were halved, effectively doubling the damage they take. In addition, Self-Destruct is a spread move, which normally means it hits all Pokémon in a double battle, allies included. However, since spread moves are disabled, self-destruct becomes single target, meaning it only affects my Pokémon, and the opponent's partner takes no damage. In practice, this means that the opponent gains a massive advantage when using self-destruct, and it's practically worthless when I use it. So, planning around the combination of self-destruct and poison-type moves, I opted to use a quote-unquote strategy revolving around Haunter. Haunter is completely immune to self-destruct thanks to its ghost typing, and it also has a 4 times resistance to the poison type, making it a decent counter to Koga's team defensively. In reality, the fight ended up being incredibly easy, Haunter was completely unnecessary, and I wasted all of your guys' time with that preamble hyping up the difficulty. You're welcome. If ever there is like a hack of Gen 5 or something that makes every battle a 3v1, count me in. Trouble brews in Saffron City. Silphco has been taken over by the Mafia, and a 10-year-old is sent in deep to deal with the hostage negotiations. Our team tears ass through Silphco until our rival, another 10-year-old who also happens to be fighting the Mafia, decides that reinforcing the social pecking order is more important than saving a building full of hostages and challenges us to a battle. This fight ended up being pretty scary, as some of our rival's Pokémon hit hard at this point in the game. Trying to decide which one was the higher priority threat wasn't exactly simple. Did I want to target whichever one did the most damage, or did I want to get rid of that annoying-ass Execute who kept spamming status moves? Ultimately, it was Snorlax who clutched up in this fight. With his combination of the moves of Rest, Sleep Talk, Yawn, and Body Slam, he was able to keep himself healthy and use Sleep Talk during his two turns of sleep. This was the set Snorlax used the entire game, and it proved incredibly effective at stalling against basically every trainer in the game. There's a reason I ranked him above Gyarados. Next up is the head of Team Rocket himself, Don Giovanni. Before that, I'm sure you're wondering what's with the picture scrolling over my chat box. Too bad I don't owe you an explanation. Anyways, on to Silphco's climactic battle against Giovanni. Giovanni has never exactly been difficult. But in this mod, he pulled out a strat that threw me for a goddamn loop when I saw it. Oh boy, I wasn't ready for that. Holy shit! That- the Nidorino's helping hand actually does something now! Oh no! <laughs> to explain why this is weird, his Nidorino used Helping Hand, a move that boosts the damage of an ally's attack by 50% that turn. The thing that's bizarre about this is that in the base game, this is a single battle, meaning by default, Nidorino has a useless move and no partner to use it on. This stupid oversight in the design of the boss now threatened to make this fight into a nightmare. And trust me when I say that this is merely one of multiple incidents where a team synergized so ridiculously well in a doubles format, you'd almost think the game was designed for it. I opted to keep the Nidorino alive regardless because I would rather have one strong Pokémon dealing 50% more damage than have two strong Pokémon doubling into me every turn. A couple risks were taken, but the fight ended without any issues. 
Next up, we should move on through Sabrina's gym without encountering any trainers. Trying not to pull an Alpha Rad here, I lead with Snorlax out the gate with the intention of knocking out most of Sabrina's physically frail psychic types with just a body slam or two, as opposed to, you know. Oh no, he's plus three! No, 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 hot dog! So no, it's hot dog! So each turn we target the Pokemon on the right, all the while Mr. Mime sets up Calm Mind and Barriers. After bringing Venomoth into potion range again, we yawn the Mr. Mime to stop it from buffing its stats anymore. A held Lumberry cures an unlucky confusion, then Dijon takes a nap and gets his health back. Both turns of sleep net a useless result, and we get confused in our sleep, causing our boy to hit himself after waking up. We manage to yawn the Mr. Mime again and finish off the Venomoth. Then next turn her Alakazam drops in one hit, setting up a future sight as it departs this mortal realm. Now it's only Mr. Mime, which sounds free on paper, but over the course of this battle, this thing has set up three Calm Mines and maxed out its defense with Barrier. To clarify, this means its special attack was 2.5 times higher than normal and its defense was multiplied by 4. To simplify even further, this goofy mime-looking son of a bitch was about to press my shit in. Knowing full well I was likely dead to a crit, I stayed in with Snorlax and risked it. Then... this happened. Uh-oh. I had forgotten about Future Sight, so that almost gave me a heart attack. Luckily, Snorlax had more than pulled its weight this fight, and the entire team was still healthy in the back. We bring in Hypno, who resists psychic attacks, and try to whittle down Mr. Mime with headbutt flinches and paralysis. And yeah, that's one way to do it. Sixth badge obtained, two to go. After beating off a bunch of dudes in the dojo real quick, the dojo master offers to let us grab one of his balls. If this ever happens to you, make sure to grab the one on your right. We do just that and obtain a Hitmonchan we name Oregano. Backtracking to the grass by Pallet Town, we nab ourselves a Tangela called- Oh, wait, never mind, it's dead. Sailing south to Cinnabar, we revive the old Amber into Aerodactyl we name Dill. Get rolled, stupid Ammonite fans. The seventh gym leader, Blaine, has somehow managed to lock himself into his gym with the only spare keys being at the bottom of a dilapidated mansion that was used for child and animal experimentation, wherein we encounter a coughing named... Donair, I guess. Heading into the next gym, we blast through a brain-dead easy quiz made for dumb, stupid babies. Wait, what? Ah! I... <clears throat> Anyways, I way over-prepared for this gym, going as far as bringing a full team of water types and setting up Rain Dance at the start of the fight. But Blaine has grown senile with age, and is now washed, in the most literal sense of the word, as our sweet water serpent hoses down his entire team for the seventh badge. Sorry, Blaine. Not even a 2v1 was enough to make you even remotely threatening. Not even one foot outside the gym, and we get kidnapped by billionaire playboy Bill, who drags us off to his private island. Might as well make the most of it. While on the islands, we pick up Sugar the Psyduck and Pickle the Ponyta. The rest of the encounters here were all duplicates. Now it's time for the 8th gym against Giovanni, the Team Rocket leader himself who just happens to have a regular job completely unrelated to his crime syndicate. This is the part of the video I've been excited to talk about because I'm about to reveal an exploit that, to my knowledge, hasn't been documented anywhere. It even works in this 2v1 hack as well. So here's how you do it. Send out a Gyarados first, level 49 or higher. Open the fight menu and move the cursor over to the move Surf. From here you just have to press the following sequence of buttons exactly. Upon doing that successfully, this battle will end, and you'll have the 8th Gym Badge. After that, we head towards Victory Road, the final barrier in the way of the Pokémon League. I was feeling pretty confident at this point, and I thought I was ready for the upcoming rival battle. Then, the rug got pulled out from under me, with an interaction I was not ready for, but in hindsight, I should have seen coming. The fight starts and we lead with Aerodactyl, almost knocking out his Pidgeot then getting hit hard by Rock Blast in return. We then switch in Snorlax, yawning the Rhyhorn and crushing Pidgeot's bones the next turn. Gyarados comes in, dropping our Snorlax's attack, but this doesn't really matter to our sleepy boy who rests himself back to full HP. We stall with the usual rest talk strats that have been carrying us so far. His Gyarados goes down finally, bringing in Charizard. Now, have a listen to my naive plan. Eh, hey, you know what, I've been, I've been abusing the shit out of Gyarados for this whole playthrough. Let's just go with Jolteon. Thunder. As far as I know, this Rhyhorn doesn't have a ground-type move. Please don't turn out to be wrong right now. Oh my god, dude! The, the double synergy on some of these teams blows my mind! Like I said, 
it's almost like these fights were designed to be double battles. After that, we switch in Chili to slaughter his Charizard, but then something truly dreadful happened. God, please don't hit like three rock blasts right now. I would actually lose this run if you did. Ah! Yeah! Hold on, boys! Hold on! No! Thankfully, we managed to pull through the fight without incident. But had that Rhyhorn spammed Rock Blast more often, we'd be in deep shit right now. At the entrance of Victory Road, we encounter an Onyx for our final encounter. I tried to name it Ground Cumin, but there wasn't enough space, so, um... We sweep the entirety of Victory Road without a care in the world, and finally arrive at the Pokemon League. The only trainers remaining are the Elite Four and Champion, all of whom need to be fought back-to-back -back without the chance to swap out any party members. Standing here at the entrance of what would be the penultimate gauntlet of this challenge, I could not have begun to imagine what was in store for me. Never in my wildest dreams could I have predicted the Elite Four going the way that it did, and to be honest, I'm still a bit shaken from it. Before that though, I lied. There is one last encounter we can get before the Elite Four. We head to the power plant in hopes of catching Magnemite or Magneton, but instead we catch an Electabuzz. I'm not sure if this nickname counts as a spice or condiment or whatever, but I was bitter after catching the worst electric type in the game. Now, it's time for the final tier list of the run. Okay, here's the last encounter list, and this one's gonna be pretty disappointing. So, yeah, I don't know. Weezing, pretty good defensively, but I never got the chance to use it really, so. In the cringe tier, however, we've got a lot of contestants. We've got Rapidash, we've got Electabuzz, fucking Gar, I was so mad when I got this. Onyx all the way here at Goaded, just kidding. Golduck, that was, it's just a mediocre water type, there's better ones. We've gotten a lot of counters throughout this adventure. Some of them great, most nigh unusable. With so many combinations to choose from, it took a great amount of thinking to narrow it down to a select team of all-stars. But this is the team I ended up choosing. Sriracha the Jolteon, the only good electric type in the game, included because both Lance and the champion have a Gyarados, which is really scary, but also four times weak to electric. Dijon the Snorlax. Simply put, no Snorlax means no team. This one was a given. Chili the Gyarados. Another given. Intimidate is too good, and there are no electric type attacks in the entire Pokemon League. Honey the Hypno. This one was included as a contingency in case shit hit the fan against Bertha. It was immune to sleep and could hit her whole team for super effective psychic damage. Cajun the Arcanine. This thing hasn't gotten the spotlight since it was a little pup against the fourth gym, but now it's all grown up and ready to go on a tear. This is the Pokemon I taught the move Substitute to. You'll see why soon enough. Of course, who could forget Onion the Venusaur. With decent defensive stats, typing, and moves like Leech Seed, Sleep Powder, Giga Drain, and Synthesis, this thing will outlive the heat death of the universe and have HP to spare. This was the vicious little band of killers that were going to carry us all the way to the top. Without further ado, let's begin the Elite Four. First up is Lorelei. Lorelei leads Dugong and Cloyster, and we lead Dijon. We target down the Dugong first. Cloyster has sky high defense, and its only attacking move is Dive, which takes two turns to come out. Because of this, and the fact that it doesn't hit hard to begin with, and the fact that it can spam Protect at random, means we can afford to keep it alive on the side while we target down its ally. After Dugong faints, Slowbro comes out. It goes down to two hits and hail chip damage, leaving Dijon drowsy from yawn. Next out is Lapras, and this is where things really go wrong. We try to rest up on the turn it switches in, so we get back to full health and yawn doesn't put us to sleep. But Lapras goes for Confuse Ray and Dijon hits himself. This starts to get really scary as Dijon gets slowly whittled down and eventually into critical hit range of Lapras's Surf. One unlucky turn here means the end. Fortunately, we get a rest off and keep fighting. And no oh boy does this fight go on. We go several turns before getting off another attack, then eventually switch into Sriracha the Jolteon, who barely misses the kill with Shockwave. As I'm cursing my luck, the Lapras's Citrus Berry takes it out of full restore range. We switch in Chili and Dragon Dance once to set up a sweep. Chili holds an Aspir Berry in case of a freeze, which doesn't end up happening. Lapras goes down to an Earthquake, and Jinx comes out. Thanks to the boost from Dragon Dance and Jinx's paper-thin defenses, it dies to a single Earthquake. Only Cloyster remains, so that's a deathless Lorelei. Next up is Bruno. Bruno has two Onyxes and nothing but weak moves on his fighting types, with the sole exception of Machamp. 
This fight is basically free, but I decided to play it safe anyways. We lead Venusaur, and Oko is Onix on turn 1. In response to this, Bruno sends in his strongest Pokémon, Onix 2. Guess how that one ended up. Machamp comes in, and we Leech Seed it for survivability as it sets up bulk ups. It now hits pretty damn hard with Cross Chop, and the next turn we are left in range of a critical hit, which is particularly scary since Cross Chop has a 1 in 8 chance as opposed to the regular 1 in 16 chance, and unfortunately, this becomes very relevant very fast. Just kidding. Like I said, Bruno is easy. We Leech Seed the Hitmonchan and count down the turns until we win. After a while, we switch into Hypno to go on the offensive, taking out Machamp and doing big damage to Hitmonlee. After Honey's underwhelming debut, we switch to Chili to finish off the Hitmonlee. With that, it's down to a 1v1 against Hitmonchan, meaning the battle is over. Second Elite 4 down without any casualties. Let's just go for double strength. This is his last Pokemon. We're, we're winning this for sure. <laughs> God damn it, I'm... Ugh. Ah, that was, that was hubris. This is a tactical play that I like to call throwing for content. The thing that hurts most is that Chili had the move Surf, which isn't physical, and I had no reason not to use it. But in my own words, the fuck are you gonna do other than just not be a dumbass? To make matters worse, Gyarados was one of my best Pokemon, and the plan for the champion pretty much revolved around it. But hey, now that I don't have a near guaranteed win condition, this Elite Four just got a lot more interesting. Moving on from that loss, we challenge Bertha next. Her team revolves around annoying statuses like confusion and sleep. However, you take away those threats and what are you left with? The easiest fight of your life. This is why Cajun knows Substitute. Going into this fight, I had no idea that the AI goes full dumbass mode against Substitute. I expected them to break it after a couple turns, but they just kept spamming useless status moves. This fight was actually free, no ironic twist this time. Cajun almost soloed her whole team. We only had to switch in Hypno towards the end, then Jolteon, but overall it wasn't too bad. The fourth Elite Four member was the one I was most afraid of. Lance has a team with three Dragon-type Pokémon that all know the move Outrage. Outrage is a 120 base power move that gets a 50% boost thanks to Stab. To make matters worse, nothing on my team resists Dragon. This fight was going to be a bloodbath no matter what, and all I could do was pray that I got lucky enough to limp to the champion afterwards. Here was the state of my morale before the fight. I really have zero confidence right now that I'm going to be beating Lance. I just don't think it's happening. I, I, will, I will try my goddamn heart out, but... With a surplus of enthusiasm and optimism, let the massacre begin. We lead with Sriracha and clap as Gyarados turn 1 with Shockwave. After getting hit with Dragon Rage, I reluctantly decided to switch in Onion to set up Leech Seed, praying he didn't get absolutely slaughtered on the switch in. After that, we got very lucky and managed to hit Leech Seed on both Dragonairs back to back without dying. Then Dijon comes out, dick swinging. It smashes Dragonair into paste with a crit, causing Lance to bring in Dragonite. Dijon wasn't done fucking, and slammed his fat body into Dragonite for another crit. Unfortunately, Citrus Berry heals it out of range of another body slam. But if you thought Dijon was done tearing ass, you are terribly mistaken. With another crit, he turns Dragonite's bones into fucking gravel. This Snorlax was irrefutably popping the fuck off. It stays in and keeps throwing itself into the enemy over and over. Eventually, Dijon runs out of nuts to bust and is forced to switch out. Screw it, time to sacrifice Hypno. Honey has one chance to save itself here, but misses the kill on Aerodactyl. Lance heals up the funny fossil bird, and Honey goes down to ancient power. Now I need to talk about a silly little quirk with Gen 3 double battles. The plan is to switch in Sriracha here and pick off Aerodactyl. But the problem is that Hypno fainted before Dragonair had attacked yet. This means that our Jolteon might get hit on the switch in before it even has a chance to move. It likely won't survive two outrages. So, with a clenched ass, we switch in Sriracha, and the Dragonair hits itself. Thank god. Aerodactyl goes down next turn to Shockwave, and Dragonair dies to Leech Seed. We managed to escape Lance with only one death, and it was arguably our worst Pokémon. As I prepare for the champion, I notice I'm very low on PP restoring items, and I have to be very selective on which moves to restore, lest we run out of moves mid-battle. The important thing to note here is that I max out Snorlax's body slams. This champion was going to be rough, and I knew it. Like I said, the Lance fight was going to be rough, but... This is gonna be fucked up. This is 
you're going to probably see most of these faces on screen. You're probably not going to be seeing them anymore after this. So with that knowledge in our hearts and minds, we move on. We take our next step to become the champion. That was my hype up speech, and as you'll see, that unrelenting pessimism was more than warranted. I'm not exaggerating when I say this fight was some of the most fucked up torture I've experienced in this children's video game. The entirety of the battle felt like I was edging myself with barbed wire, start to finish. This fight took over 40 minutes of my life, and I even used emulator speed up for some parts of it. For the start of it, I'll switch back to live commentary meaty, since I believe he explained the situation quite well. This Pidgeot's gonna be ruining my day. I could put it to sleep, or I could attack the Alakazam. I'm thinking the Alakazam sets up Reflect turn 1 instead of attacking, so I'm not going to be able to kill it in one hit regardless, and then it's either just going to recover or Psychic. So I'm going to try putting the Pidgeot to sleep, and then if Alakazam sets up Reflect, I'm going to try putting it to sleep as well. Okay, that's what I thought. Second turn in and Alakazam hits a hard critical hit Psychic. It's not risky to stay in with Snorlax, but we do regardless, resting back to full health. We use a couple of useless sleep talks, then target Alakazam with Yawn. The accuracy drops from Sand Attack are starting to make each attack very risky. Eventually, we put Alakazam to sleep, then switch into Jolteon to paralyze Pidgeot. We go balls to the walls here and attempt to whittle down Alakazam with Shockwave, since it's guaranteed to hit. Around this moment, I felt overwhelmed with choices. Ultimately, I decided to risk Jolteon in order to get rid of Alakazam, as it threatened my whole team. It got off Shockwave 2 and 3, managing to take it out. Unfortunately, Pidgeot Revenge kills Sriracha. There goes our Gyarados counter. We switch in Venusaur and get a free kill on Rhydon. Then out comes the champion's ace, Charizard. I see my out here, so I switch into Cajun with the hope that the Charizard goes for Fire Blast. Cajun's ability Flash Fire would allow it to nullify the damage and get a boost to his fire attacks. But to my dismay, the Fire Blast missed. At this point, I'm taking into account everything I know about the Gen 3 AI. Basically, when a Pokémon can have multiple abilities, the AI makes a 50-50 guess and chooses a move accordingly. However, since our Arcanine very clearly doesn't have Intimidate as an ability, the AI should already be aware of this. With this in mind, setting up a substitute here would prove futile, since Charizard can easily break it in one hit with Wing Attack. Since I wanted to keep the Pidgeot alive, the only reasonable play here is to extreme speed into Charizard. But then this happens. With that boost, Flamethrower is now Cajun's strongest move against Charizard. Had I known this would happen, I would have substituted to avoid the Pidgeot's sand attack. This really screwed us over the turn immediately afterwards, when Cajun missed a Flamethrower that would normally be 100% accurate. Then I see Charizard's damage output, and I realize he won't break the substitute in one hit. Cajun substitutes the next turn, praying the Pidgeot gets fully parried again. Unluckily, they both double into Cajun next turn, so we only have one more chance for Substitute to work. Pidgeot gets fully paralyzed the next turn, and we keep the Substitute, giving us a guaranteed attack next turn. Maybe two if we're lucky. We go for Flamethrower again, which misses. I truly have no words. Flamethrower into Charizard. Oh, we could have killed it! Cajun gets doubled into again, and goes down. Now, we only have a sleeping Snorlax and a Venusaur against Charizard, Pidgeot, Executor, and Gyarados. Even if this battle were a 1v1, this would be hard to come back from. At this point, I knew the run was over. It would take nothing short of a miracle to come back from this. Honestly, this run had been doomed ever since we lost Gyarados to Bruno, and we were living on borrowed time. Finally, my mistakes had caught up with me. So, I send in Dijon and click Sleep Talk, praying for some sort of divine intervention. Oh! Yo! What I didn't see coming was Daddy Dijon crashing into Charizard with the force of a goddamn freight train, separating the poor fucker's soul from his body. I did say it would take nothing short of a miracle, and I wasn't lying. After doing some quick maths, it turned out this was about a 1.04% chance to happen. To put it simply, not only does Dijon fuck, he does not pull out. We stay in with Dijon and get a couple useless sleep talks, which is fine because this thing has earned a nap. On wake up, we yawn the Executor, who ends up missing two egg bombs in a row. This is the most blessed Snorlax of all time. We rest up again, and with Executor asleep, 
We take a risk and swap in Venusaur to set up a Leech Seed on Pidgeot. Thankfully, it gets paired twice in a row. I like to think of this as Sriracha's spirit watching over us, guiding us to victory. We swap Dijon back in, trying to get some damage on Executor and Pidgeot in order to knock them out at around the same time. Pidgeot gets fully restored, and so does Executor the turn following. The accuracy drops start to make this scary, but no missed attacks so far. Dijon stalls out Pidgeot till it dies of old age, and now the champion is down to his final two. Gyarados was a huge problem. Its thrash could do monstrous damage, and he crits on the first turn for two-thirds of Dijon's health. The Executor at this point has run out of damaging moves and is only spamming Sleep Powder and Light Screen. I had no idea which was the higher priority threat, so I targeted down the Executor. This turn we try and get a rest off before Executor puts us to sleep. But unfortunately, we're too slow and get hit with Sleep Powder. The problem with this is that Sleep Powder can last up to five turns. Unfortunately, Dijon gets the three turn sleep and is now dead to Thrash. The Snorlax just needs to get lucky one more time. It ended up getting a fourth turn of sleep, but as long as the Gyarados hits itself, Dijon can evade the sweet embrace of death for a little longer. But sooner or later, even the most blessed Snorlax runs out of luck. Then there was one. Onion, standing atop of mountain of dead bodies, entered the cage. He shouldered the weight of my sins and the dying wishes of those who had passed before him. His cry, a requiem of grief to his fallen comrades. He looked his opponents right in the eye and uttered these words. None of you will leave this place alive. That Viagra shit works. Sup, Chad? I'm fast as fuck, boy. Oh. Wake up. I'll see you in hell. Yeah, I have no fucking clue how we won that one either. Onion sprayed the walls with the viscera of our foes and paved a path in blood and vengeance into the Hall of Fame. With that, the title of champion is ours, and the run is complete. There's one lesson I've learned from all this. It's that a good Snorlax is important, but you should never forget the Venusaur that stayed by your side from the beginning. Anyways, the run is now over, which means it's time for you to leave, because I'm about to start shilling, and you don't want to hear any of that. Videos like this one take up copious amounts of time to make, and while I've been mostly doing it for fun, I think it's a shame that they don't reach a broader audience who would probably enjoy them. I'm not really all that comfortable with shamelessly advertising my content, so if you've made it this far, I humbly ask that you share this video or any future ones with people who might be interested. Or not. I'm not paying you or anything, I just really appreciate it. As always, hope you had a pleasant viewing experience and more of these types of videos to come in the future. Bye!